What's the word, y'all? NBA play-in starts tonight, and I cannot be more excited about it, but I feel like this is the perfect time to put my little bow on the NBA regular season, and we're going to be talking about the rest of the awards. We were supposed to do NBA award week. I fumbled that bag, but we did already talk about rookie of the year, defensive player of the year, coach of the year, so we're going to talk about the rest, which is MVP, six man of the year, Tyler Hero, by the way, MVP, six man of the year, most approved player, maybe executive of the year if I feel nice, and then the all NBA teams. This is the final one, so, so lock in, ladies and gentlemen. I do want to remind people that I'm just a guy with a microphone that watches some basketball. And in a year like this, there are so many different options. So you might disagree with who my winners are. That's completely okay. So many people have valid, valid reasons to be in conversations. And I want to reiterate, this is not a prediction video. I'm not predicting who will win these awards. But if I had a ballot, these are the people that I would vote for. Are we ready? Don't tweet at me if you disagree, bro. Don't, don't do, you're going to do it any, okay. I think we start at six man of the year because we all are going to go with Tyler Hero. Even though actually that's not true. I have been hearing some people not go Tyler Hero because they're, they're standing on the hill. And though I don't agree with the take, I respect people standing on the hill. Some people believe that Tyler Hero should not win six man of the year because he played like 33 minutes per game, which is a lot of minutes, obviously for somebody that's coming off the bench. But like, this is not the first time that's happened. Lou Williams is putting up 30 minutes per game. Jamal Crawford is putting up like 30 minutes per game. This is not something like necessarily new. You know, but I have been seeing people say that, hey, that's way too many, too many minutes for me to consider him a six man. And right now in real life, the only thing you really need to be classified as a six man is to come off the bench for 51 percent of your games. And you have to have a threshold, basically. But either way, in my opinion, Tyler Hero is still the six man of the year. But I do want to show some love to to Kevin. Kevin, Kevin, Love, yeah, you see that? Kevin Love and Cam Johnson, because both did amazing things on, on winning teams this season and less amount of minutes, but you saw their impact anytime they came onto the floor. I mean, just yesterday, I know it was a game that didn't really matter. This man, Kevin Love, had 30 points in 15 minutes. Like, that's just something, I guess he didn't do it regularly, but he had the impact, especially consider last year, he was throwing tipper tantrums and he was going through some things and to kind of see a rejuvenation and not just his play on the court, but his overall morale was great to see. And Cam, John, Cam Johnson is a guy that if I didn't already have two, four, six, seven most improved player candidates. And legit, I have seven names for most improved player right here. If I didn't have just seven, Cam Johnson would be maybe eight on my list. So shout out to Cam for being like the oldest man drafted of all time. And people are laughing at the fact that he was the oldest man drafted of all time. And he shut some people up. And uh, he's a very important part to a championship quality team. So that's that. Let's get to most improved player next. Like I said, I have seven legit seven different candidates and you know what I'm going against the grain throughout NBA history there's only been a few players who have won six man of the year oh, I'm sorry most improved player while being a year two player because the argument against that is that Kenny he, he's just getting off his rookie season of course he's going to be better in year number two and I always hear that and I don't agree bro we see players not take a jump in year number two it actually I would say more likely than not people are not taking a big jump in year number two so personally if I had a pick I'm going to give my most improved player to a year two guy this season specifically it's gonna be different for every year but let me count you or let me read you the seven names legit seven names that were in consideration for the winner of this award John Morant if you remember at the beginning of the season I made a prediction video me predicting all of the major NBA awards and, and in that video I predicted that John Morant was going to win most improved player I didn't hit on anything else really, but John Morant is at least in, in the conversation. So I'll take that as a W. Basically what I did is I looked throughout history. Who is a player or I, what is the pattern when it comes to most improved player? And what I saw was really good slash borderline all-star player jumps into either superstardom or jumps into all-stardom. And I just looked at the people that were on the outside looking in on the all-star game last season, saw John Morant, knew that he was a stud. So I was like, ah, he going to win most improved player. And I wouldn't be surprised if he did win the award, but I think that, you know, with him missing 23 or so games, um, I, I think that more people, I think it was Draymond Green actually that said that John Moran is not a most improved player candidate. He's an MVP candidate. You know what I'm saying? He did more than just get better, but I think two things can exist. Like even, I think it might have been the first Giannis MVP year. It was real consideration for Giannis to be most improved player, you know, but John Moran is on my top seven but he did not end up getting number one. Number two, when it comes to most, most improved player for me, was um, Darius Garland. This is no order, but these are just the seven players. Darius Garland. And I know the numbers don't look super crazy when you look at his year two year versus year three year. But if you watch Darius Garland in year two, you saw some flash. You saw that he was going to be solid. But in year number three, he turned into a legit one of the best floor generals in the entire NBA. And I got to show him love, even though he only jumped up like five points per game or something like that. The next guy is going to be Jordan Poole, who went from I don't even know how many points 
points per game, but this year feels like he's averaging 20. He is another splash brother. Now, of course, he ain't been there since Clay and Steph Curry, but I think he's a he's a splash nephew. You know what I'm saying? Slash son? No, that's that's not that much. But regardless, Jordan Poole has been really, really good this season. Coming off a year where he was getting PT for sure, but he solidified himself as one of the staples in this team that is trying to win a championship. He will not get no DMPs. Actually, they're relying on him to have really good moments as playoffs if they want to go on a championship run. The next guy is Miles Bridges. Now, Miles Bridges kind of fell off, if that's the words you want to use. Very early on, it felt like he might have been the runaway because he started off average at like 25 points per game, but then he cooled off that three-point shot that was followed in the first couple months of the season kind of fell off as well but he still had a complete season in my personal opinion and he should be in top seven the next one is DeJounte Murray from 15 points per game to 21 points per game um DeMar DeRozan leaves and they're looking for the guy and everybody knew it was going to be DeJounte but we didn't know how much of an improvement he was going to have and he had a huge and huge improvement the next guy is Desmond Bain this is a year to do my last two dudes are year to do's um Desmond Bain I remember early or in the offseason they traded away Grayson Allen and then they traded away Jonas Valanciunas and a lot of people were trying to question where some extra points were going to go and I remember watching Summer League and seeing that they were giving Desmond Bain to the ball to be the point guard at Summer League and in Summer League I was extremely impressed with everything I saw but my philosophy has changed at the beginning of the season I probably would have put Desmond Bain in my most improved player conversation actually if you watch my podcast um when we were doing predictions I predicted that Desmond Bain was going to take a huge leap but I, I I think after that I said, but he's year two, so he ain't going to win most improved player. I think that's still true. I don't think Desmond Bain's going to win most improved player, but spoiler alert, he is my number one. And then another guy that is in my top seven is Tyrese Maxey, another year two dude who took a huge, huge jump. Desmond Bain went from a guy who's like, oh, how the heck did he fall to number 30 in this year's draft to whoa, I cannot believe that so many opposing GMs look past Desmond Bain because he is an absolute stud. And the runs where John Morant was out, the 21-2 and two or 21-3 and three run, whatever it is, a lot of that is just Desmond Bain turning it on. I know it's a lot of team stuff, but Desmond Bain was an absolute stud, and I no longer subscribe to year two players shouldn't be in conversation for this award. I'm giving it to Desmond Bain. And if you're wondering who my two and my three is, my two is Jordan Poole, and my three... I guess I'm going Tyrese Maxey as my three, or DeJounte Murray, or Miles Bridges, or Darius Garland, or John Morant. Executive of the year is not one we're going to spend a lot of time on. It's an interesting one. I think in the first half of the season, everybody was like, it's a tuni- a trueness, carny show, Arturis Connie Chauvis, there it is. Uh, but then the Bulls fell off in the second half of the season, so maybe he don't get as much love. But if you're looking at the first half of the season, boom, DeMar DeRozan uh, signing trade. Boom, Lonzo Ball signing trade. Alex Caruso signing. Derrick Jones Jr., Javante Green resigning. He had a, a Ayo DeSumo draft. It was a very good offseason for the Chicago Bulls. And you know what? Actually, I'm still giving it to him. Yep, call me a homer all you want. Um, the person I had in first place before I just talked myself into it was Pat Riley. And Pat Riley and them didn't do anything crazy over the offseason other than getting Kyle Lowry and finding like Caleb Martin to blossom into a role player and Max Strews to blossom into a role player. Um, but I think that Carney Show has probably had the overall better offseason just because he made so many moves and a lot of them worked out well. Riley already had a good team that he just added on to. I don't really know. Are we ready for the big conversation? Are y'all are you ready for the big conversation? The MVP conversation. Of course, it has been narrowed down to Giannis, Embiid, and Jokic. Those are the top three. My number four was Luka Doncic. My number five was Devin Booker. And my number six was Jason Tatum. Those are my top six MVP candidates. But it's trying to figure out the order of the top three. And throughout this season, I've seen and I've I've watched a lot of basketball, and my MVP has changed a ton this year, as it should. I, I, like, if I was just going off the first month of the season, Steph Curry would still, <laughs> Steph Curry would still be my MVP. So it changed a bunch this year. But as we end, I, I have to, you know, pick a name. And one thing I don't like about NBA discourse is, of course, everybody's going to have their opinion about these top three dudes as far as who deserves to win. And again, I'm not saying anybody is wrong if they disagree with my final take. I hate the side of Twitter or conversations that is like, I got Giannis as my MVP, so let me poke all the holes in Jokic's case. Let me poke all the holes in Joel, in Joel Embiid's case. These are three super good, and some of them even legendary seasons. Let, let me let me talk to you how legendary this is. Joel Embiid won the scoring champ. He was the first center to do it since Shaquille O'Neal. He is the first international player to ever do it, and he is the first center with 30 points per game in under 40 minutes. These are all from StatMuse, by the way. That is legendary. 40 in 10 games... In a season system merger, 13 Joel Embiid, the most in all time. 
Then you got Russell Westbrook in 2017. You got Moses Malone in 1982. And the last two dudes to do that, one MVP. Points per minute by a center. You got two years by Will Chamberlain. First of all, Will Chamberlain, I'm not going to say your stats don't count because they obviously do. But the fact that Joel Embiid is even in the conversations with this Will Chamberlain fella, this this fable of a player, this dude that seems like he is a myth, is crazy. Joel Embiid in 2020, 2021, and then this season, Joel Embiid. Most points per minute by a center. Then we get to Nikola Jokic. He is the first player in NBA history to have 2,000 points, 1,000 rebounds, and 500 assists. And you can argue that they're arbitrary, but still, nobody has ever done that damn feat. He is the first to average 25, 13, and 6 in a season. He's actually averaging more than that, by the way. And he is the first player in the top 10 for points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game, and field goal percentage in the last 50 years. He had 20 10-plus assist games this year. That is the most by a center by 18. Of all the MVP candidates, he had the most games where he was leading his team in points, rebounds, and assists with 39. In about half the games this year, Nikola Jokic led his teams in points, rebounds, and assists. Shout out to Luka, though. He's not too far behind at 32, but like half of your games is kind of wild. Jokic is in the midst of the greatest PER season of all time, and he's winning every single advanced stat imaginable when you're comparing it across the top three candidates. Then we get to Giannis. The most 30 point, 10 rebound, 5 assist games this season is Giannis at number one and Jokic at number two. And Giannis has 21. Jokic has 20, and no other person has 12. Here's another arbitrary one, but I li like, if you've watched this channel for some time, you know I love the good old cherry pick statistic and this is another one there has been three season nba history where a player averaged 25 points 10 rebounds five assists one steal one block on 55 percent shooting and all three of them are by Giannis. like i said it's it's arbitrary slash cherry pick but i love those statistics i love it anyway i just wanted to to show the love to the top three candidates because all of them are having amazing seasons but i can only vote for one and and if you ask me right now who is my mvp I'm going to say Nikola Jokic. Now, if you've been watching for some time, I, I broke down my own personal criteria. I know everybody looks at MVP a little bit differently. I broke it down to counting stats, advanced stats, narrative, team success, rememberable moments, and team without them is the way I got it written down. And not all six of these are weighted the same. Some of them are less than others. But when I tallied up everything, Nikola Jokic was my number one. And and it's it's unfortunate for like Joel Embiid because he's been fighting so damn hard to get that first MVP award. And I feel for him. But in my personal opinion, Nikola Jokic's impact by my own criteria was just a little bit more. And it wasn't by a lot. It legit was not by a lot. I have um, Joel Embiid as my number two and Giannis as my number three in my race. For the people that think that it's just the advanced stats thing, it is not because I, I still believe that though advanced stats are an important part of this game, they can be, I'm not going to say manipulated because they can't be manipulated, but they can be, oh man, what, I don't even know the word I'm trying to think of. If you look at all of the defensive advanced stats, they all say Nikola Jokic is a better defender than Joel Embiid and Giannis. So th that's what I mean. Advanced stats don't tell you everything. You have to, of course, watch these games. Though Jokic is a for sure improved defender, he's not Giannis and he's not Joel Embiid. Both of those players are in real life conversations for all defensive teams, and one of them is in conversations for Defensive Player of the Year. But if you look at the only the advanced stats, you would think that Nikola Jokic is the greatest defender in the league right now. So you you have to use your eye test, you have to use statistics, you have to use a combination of all of those things, and that's what I did, and that's how I came up with my my final answer of Nikola Jokic. But man, if you got Joel Embiid as your MVP, you're not wrong. If you got Giannis as your MVP, you not wrong. But if you have anybody else other than those top three, I'm sorry. I, I can't I can't really get around how my mind of anybody taking over those top three. That's why I ended with Luca and I ended with Book and then I ended with Tatum as my, my rounding out my top six. But it has just been those three guys. And it's a shame that we're pretty much done watching these dudes dominate a regular season. Luckily for us, we are at least, at least getting four more games of these dudes. At least four more games and it would be a travesty if any of these guys got swept in the first round of the playoffs but at the bare minimum we get four more times to watch these dudes play and some of these dudes should be on their way to another deep playoff run only time will tell so now we're going to transition to my all nba 
teams, okay? And if you listen slash watch any podcasts, any writings about All-NBA over the last couple years, you would know that the NBA decided to allow Jokic to classify as a forward, to allow Joel Embiid to classify as a forward because, hey, they might be the two best players in the league right now, the two most valuable players in the league right now, so we have to have them on All-NBA first team, right? Wrong. I, this is a hill I am willing to die on until the NBA decides to make these things positionless. And I had the same argument over the All Star break. It, until they decide to make these things positionless, if you want me to put one center, I'm putting one center. How many minutes has Jokic played at Power Forward? How many minutes has Embiid played at Power Forward? Close to none. 99, 98% of their minutes are at center, so I'm classifying them as center. So, yes, one of them is going to be down a team on the second team. And you know who it's going to be because I already told you my MVP is the NBA. You got to fix it. You got to fix it, especially when we're talking about contracts on the line, especially when we're talking about legacies on the line. There are going to be some people that should be in conversations for all NBA teams that won't make the cut because, well, the position that they play at is overloaded. And there might be a position that got nobody that deserved to be there. But instead, uh, that's how you get. I'm not trying to bring up old wounds. That's how you get Wiggins to the All-Star game. That's how you get Wiggins as All-Star starter because Wiggins was having a good season. But there was no other force that deserved to be there, even though there were 17 guards that deserved to be there more. So, yes, Embiid is on my second team when he deserves to be on the first team. But this is not a Joel Embiid argument. This is an argument against the NBA. All right? Cool. Now, with that being said, you should know who my NBA first team is because I told you my MVPs. I had Luka as a top six MVP candidate. I had Devin Booker as a top six MVP candidate. I had Giannis as a top three MVP candidate. I had Tatum as top six. And I had Jokic as my winner. So that is my first team. My second team gets a little bit more interesting. We have Steph Curry who, um, you know, he went through his own little shooting slump, but even the Steph Curry shooting slump is still really damn good. Um, it just wasn't greatest shooter of all time good like it had been for the last decade or so. But Steph Curry still deserves to be all NBA second team. I also have John Moran on the second team. I have Kevin Durant on the second team. He missed a portion of the season for sure. But I actually, and I might be different than some people here, I didn't really take into consideration um, games missed that much. It may have played like 1%, you know, but not that much. I do remember that the Brooklyn Nets were the one seed before Kevin Durant went down with his injury, and then they proceeded to lose 11 straight games. And Kevin Durant is a bucket, and he deserves to be on the all-NBA team. My second fourth is DeMar DeRozan. Oh, you oh, you thought I was going to say somebody else. No, DeMar DeRozan. Again, the Bulls have been on this tail spin. They've been bad for the last month or so, two months if you want to call it that. But one thing that has been consistent is DeMar DeRozan. We had a 50-piece a couple weeks ago. We've had three game-winning shots, and he I'm pretty sure he is the leading scorer when it comes to fourth-quarter points. And he has closed out so many games for this Bulls team. They should not be where they are right now. And they would not be where they are right now without DeMar DeRozan being great. And there was a conversation for Bro to be on the first team. But the second half of the season, of course, did what they what it did. And he fell down to my second team. And like I said earlier, Joel Embiid is my third team center. Or second team center. Second team center. Second team. Second team. Second team. We're going to get down to my third team. My first two guards of my third team are Trey Young. And Chris Paul, if I'm not mistaken, Trey Young led the entire league in total points and he led the entire league in assists, which is an amazing, amazing feat. But I will say that the reason he's on the third team is that he is a guard and he's going against some of the most elite in the league. And he is, of course, an elite guard as well. Um, but I feel like if he would, if this was positionless, he might have been able to get up all the way to my second team. But since it's not positionless, he's got to settle for third team for today. Um, team success did play somewhat of a role in it. Um, similarly with like Kevin Durant as well, right? Kevin Durant is on the second team because, well, his team was was kind of not not that great. And they ended up being in a play in. And same thing with Trey Young. My second uh, guard on my third team is Christopher Emmanuel Paul. Anytime we refer to him for the first time in the video, we say the full name. And then after that, he's just Chris or he's just CP or he's CP3. But he's Christopher Emmanuel Paul once you first say it. So shout out to CP3. These are my last people. The first one on the last group is LeBron James, I know they completely missed the playoffs and he'd actually be the or completely missed the play and he'd be the only player on my list to do such a thing. Every single well, every single other person here was at least top 10 in their conference. But LeBron James averaged at 30 points and I know he didn't hit the classification to end up being actually on like the scoring title list. But LeBron was still amazing this season, man. And he did what he could to do what he could, but it just wasn't good enough because the team is trash. And he had his moments, too. He's not he's not completely void of blame here, but he still put up an amazing season, if you ask me. And, and if you weren't watching the Lakers and watching LeBron do his things, you were kind of missing out. Of course, they weren't good, but LeBron's putting up some crazy, crazy performances this season. My other forward is Pascal Siakam, a guy that didn't even really come into conversations for all, um, All-Star 
but he's been amazing. He's one of the main reasons why the, the Toronto Raptors went from a team that might be a play-in team to a team that is guaranteed their self, the number five seed. Um, he's been really, really good. And I think somebody was talking, I was listening to the No Ducks podcast, and they were talking about someone else's tweet about him having the most ethical 30-point games. Basically not saying that he don't really foul bait and stuff like that. It's just bucket after bucket after bucket, whether it be a spin move, whether it be putting you on the block, whether it be a corner three, whether it be a pull up. Pascal Siakam's bag is a lot deeper than a lot of people give him credit for. So shout out to Pascal. And then my third team center is Carl Anthony Towns. And that is my list. And I, I know there's going to be some Miami Heat fans like Kenny we are the number one team in the Eastern Conference, and you trying to tell me we don't have an all-NBA player? Yep. That's just the way it goes. It's only 15 spots. It's only 15 spots. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I don't know who I'm taking off my list in order to put Jimmy, or I'm not taking off my top three centers to put Bam, even though Bam might be the defensive player of the year. Um, who, who else do I feel like is going to complain? I think everybody's going to complain because opinion not like mine, so must be wrong. You know, that's how the internet works. Are Jazz fans going to be upset that I didn't put Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert on the team? Maybe. Maybe. But I feel like I covered base on basically every team um, that deserves to have a player or every superstar that deserves to be there. I feel like I covered base there. Um, so there it is, man. Those are the finals of my awards. Hopefully you enjoyed, even if you disagreed, hopefully I gave you some entertaining takes and things like that. Um, I'm just happy that we got to the point where like every single award is up in the air, right? The, the league is so, so damn talented that there are so many different options. MVP, rookie of the year, defensive player of the year, most improved player. And even you get boiled down to coach of the year are all up for grabs right now. And there and there's like 30 people that if they won those awards, I would be like, oh, OK, cool. I can't say that somebody was snubbed or robbed of an award as long as you got Scotty Mobley or Kane in your top three. If one of them wins, nobody, nobody was uh, was messed up as long as you got Jokic and Bede and Giannis. Nobody was snubbed at the award. Nobody was robbed of those awards. Defense player of the year is like eight people. I was like, okay. Coach of the year. I I do think that Monty deserves it, but I understand the argument for Taylor Jenkins 100 percent You know what I'm saying? Um, so there won't be robberies, in my personal opinion. And and I trust the I trust 77% of the voters um to get it right. R right, whatever that means. If you enjoyed the video, leave it a like.